Good morning, Stone Creek. My name is Ryan Wilson, and I serve as a small group leader. Today, I'm going to read our teaching text for the day. So if you have your Bible, let's get them out and turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. We do this here at Stone Creek because we are a people of a book. Our understanding of God is not shaped primarily by experience, tradition, popular opinion, culture, or what we're comfortable with. Our understanding of God is shaped by the written word of God that points to the living word, Jesus. God's words aren't a weapon used to hurt people, but a lifeline to save them. This is our first source, final authority, the greatest love story ever written, and the best part of all is true. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Since the beginning of time, great speeches have shaped the world. Martin Luther King's, I have a dream to fight for equal rights. John F. Kennedy's, we're going to the moon when we took one huge step for mankind. But no words have shaped our world like those found in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These ancient words spoken by a rabbi on a mountainside in first century Palestine have been more read, repeated, and studied than almost any other words in history. They've been written about in countless books, spoken about in countless sermons, and they've been the subject of the most intense theological debates. These words created a culture and will do it again today. A kingdom culture. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Hey, if we hadn't had a chance to meet, my name is Stephen Gibbs. I am uh, a husband, 35 years, just thought of that. Four, dad of four, uh, granddad, uh, excuse me, father-in-law to three, granddad of four, um, and so I'm also the senior pastor here, and so if you're new, just so glad that you're here with us. One of the things that we want to happen today is we want you to feel encouraged today. We want you to feel challenged to change. We want you to find your people. We want you to learn what it means to be discipled and formed in the way of Jesus, and also we want to be sure that you don't just think that Jesus is someone to meet your needs, but he's the answer to everything you've ever been looking for. Amen, somebody? Right, and it's a holiday weekend, right? And usually holiday weekend's a little low on energy, so I need your help, right? You gotta fill the gap for other people who aren't here today. So I'm just gonna say amen, and you're gonna say, and then I'm gonna just say anything good, and you're gonna say, there you go. Then you're gonna say, you're the best. Yeah, amen, that works, that's better. Hey, that's great. So we're in this series today called Kingdom Culture. Let's all say that together, Kingdom Culture. Just unpacking what it means for God's kingdom to come to earth. And listen, kingdoms rise and fall based on the development of weapons, right? Kingdoms rise and fall based on the development of weapons. So for instance, the Egyptian empire began to rise based on the development of the chariot because all of a sudden now it could travel large distances and take over and go into battle into different countries. You had the Persian empire. It began to develop. It began to take new ground because of the bow and arrow, right? And it was said that the Persians would fire so many arrows in the air at the same time, it would actually cause a shadow from the sun. Like there's a quote from the Battle of Thermopylae that uh, the Spartans 
said, well, at least we'll get to fight in the shade because there's so many arrows in the air. And then we move on to um, the Roman armor that you see there. Romans developed the, uh, the chest armor and obviously the helmet, and they had their own special shields um, to do, to, so they could withstand the onslaught from the Persians. Then you had the Macedonian, excuse me, uh, that was the Greeks. Then you had the Macedonian army uh, that Philip of Macedon actually developed this long sword called the Sarissa that he gave to his son that you may know, Alexander the Great, who conquered most of the known world. He was able to use that long sword to be able to pierce through the armor. And then you had the Romans that came along and the Romans developed a gladius sword that helped them to conquer a quarter of the known world. 70 million people were under their rule at one time, all because of the development of this one particular, uh, one, this one particular weapon. And then you had the English who wanted to keep their distance from that sword. So they developed a long bow that could fire almost 200 yards and break through trees and limbs uh, to be able to pierce through the armor. And then eventually you got to the Chinese who developed gunpowder and other things. Gun that's, that's funny, y'all. Y'all got to go with me on that. That's funny. Uh, they developed gunpowder that developed a cannon to help them to be able to be successful. And eventually, you get the United States military machine with the Springfield rifle, the Gatling gun. Um, you ended up with aircraft carriers. And of course, eventually, you ended up with the nuclear bomb. And all these weapons helped nations to conquer, helped empires to spread, and they helped kingdoms to be established. And so when Jesus shows up on the scene, Jesus didn't show up just to be a nice person. He didn't show up just to give us some good morals. He didn't show up just to give us some talking points. Jesus came to go to war. And he came to go to war against the kingdom of darkness and go to war for us against the battle of darkness and against death. Like this is who Jesus is. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible in Exodus chapter 15. It says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name, right? The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. There's a phrase in the Bible, Lord of hosts. It's in the Old Testament. How many people have ever read that in the Bible? Lord of hosts. Okay. It's in there 260 times in the Old Testament. And it means the God of angel armies, Right. This is the image that we get of the battle that Jesus came to fight for us. And he didn't just come to help us be good, but to help us be powerful, but to help us be powerful. In first in second Corinthians chapter four, it says the weapons are of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are what divine in power. Right. So that we can have power to live lives in a kingdom culture, kingdom culture. The weapons of a kingdom culture are the king's prayer. Right. The weapons of the kingdom culture, it is the king's prayer. Now, you may affectionately know, know it as the Lord's prayer. You've heard that, or maybe the Our Father. But what we see in what Ryan just read is that we get the Lord's prayer. Now, I know what you're thinking. Stephen, weapons, this feels underwhelming, right? Because you've all watched Friday Night Lights and those high school football players quote and recite the Lord's prayer, haven't you? Right? And I can remember when my boys were in middle school, right before their basketball games, uh, they would hold hands and recite the Lord's Prayer. Doesn't feel like super powerful, does it? Just feels like some words that we say. And some of you may be used to growing up and, and understanding and hearing it, but, but the reality is the early church knew that this was the secret weapon, that this was how to access the presence of God. This was how to experience God being active in your life. They knew that when Jesus prayed, things happened. They knew that the foundation of him being able to calm the storm or being able to heal someone was this type of prayer. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you read the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's about to go uh, to be executed, this is the model for the prayer that he prayed. This is where Jesus found the strength to take it all the way to the cross. This is the power that the early church experienced. Now, now I think most people here, you want more from your prayer life than you're getting. Can I get an amen? I think you want more from your prayer life. You know, what we see in the Bible and what we see from prayer warriors in history is that when people learn to pray and they commit to praying, power gets exercised. Now, not the kind of power that allows you to be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, okay? But maybe. But it's a power that can help you walk through the battles of life with confidence. That when things seem to happen, and things don't seem to go your way, you can navigate difficulties with so much more grace and strength and hope. You want more from your prayer life because there is more available. Listen, you get power when the king's prayer becomes your prayer. 
Amen, somebody? Like you get power when the king's prayer becomes your prayer. So let's unpack this just a little bit in Matthew Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. Now, what's pretty interesting about this is we're in the Sermon on the Mount which Jesus is just unveiling his manifesto for life. And this particular prayer is at the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It is at the heart of everything that Jesus is trying to teach us. In the midst of that, we see seven different requests or what the Bible would call petitions. We're gonna go through uh, most, uh, go through just a handful of that today. We're gonna finish up next week. So if we get to the end of my time and you look and you're like, we're not even close to finished, you're right, we're not, but um, that's funny. Y'all should laugh right there. Come on, we need some feedback. Let's go. Um, and so, but I'm gonna finish it next week, so it's gonna be two parts. And so um, the first thing that Jesus points out is how not to pray, right? How not to pray. And in verse five, Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. I say to you, they, they've got their reward. Then he goes down, and even in verse seven, he says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, where they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So the first thing he does is establish this fact. Some prayers work, and some prayers don't. Some prayers work, and some prayers don't. Now, now you may think that's logical. You're like, yeah, I, I've, I've prayed some prayers that didn't seem to work. You know, and as they say, I guess every prayer does get answered. Yes, no, or maybe. But when it's a no, that's not real helpful, is it? But some prayers work and some prayers don't. And God does say no, because sometimes he knows if he gives us what we're asking for, it's probably not going to be what's best for us. But there are some ways to pray that we can know that actually help God to uh, respond to our prayers. And he gives us two of them right here. I'm going to add two off the top. So we'll look at four just briefly. Now, now, the first reason why prayers don't work is when there's sin in your life. In Psalm chapter 66, it says, if I had a if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Okay, so when there's some sin in our lives, some things that we know we should do that we haven't done or some lifestyle that we're living in or some unfinished business, God doesn't answer our prayers. Now, this is a little bit got some tension in it because there's always gonna be uh, something we're working on, right? There's always gonna be some area of our life we're trying to grow in and maybe we sin, you know, and, and not all of those keep us our prayers from being heard. But the truth is, there's some of us in the room, you know some things that God wants you to do, and you're still praying, and he's just like, I, I told you what to do over there. It's like a parent with his kid, you know? I told you what to do over there, you should get that. So one is sin, another one is just selfishness. James says you, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly for your own passions. Now, now this one is uh, when we pray selfish prayers, says he doesn't answer. But so then you have to classify what is a selfish prayer? That's where the trick comes because doesn't God want us to pray about everything? He says, pray without ceasing is what the Bible says. But I think what, again, he's trying to get at motives here. Like, why are you praying? Is it, is all the prayers you pray, is it God would bless your day, you would get that bonus and my kids would make good grades? Like, is that the level of our prayers? And Jesus is trying to expand our vision of prayer and our understanding that it isn't always selfish prayers. So we have sin will get in the way, selfishness will get in the way, and then we get to the hypocrites where we see self-centered prayers. Now, in the Roman culture where Jesus was speaking, there was this, uh, when you had at, in the Roman theater, they, you would have actors that would play multiple parts. And the way that they changed characters in the <clears throat> presentation was with different masks. So they would put different masks on to be different people, and they were called hypocrites. Anybody here know a hypocrite? Come on, anybody in here is a hypocrite, right? We're all, we're all one, technically, because we've all said things to impress somebody else, hello? We've all worn things we didn't like to impress somebody else. We've all bought things with money we didn't have to spend to impress somebody else. So in theory, in theory, we've all put on a mask. Jesus is specifically talking about the religious authorities because they would stand in the street corners, it says, and they would stand in the synagogues, that was their version of church, in order that they may what? Be seen by others. That they would be seen by others. So they would pray out loud. They would pray really long. And they would pray for everybody to see them. And he says they got their reward. Good job. That was the reward that they got. Now, ironically, this, 
this is all about being self-centered. It's about me. Now, we don't really experience this version of self-centeredness as much. Some people do. But we more experience it when we don't want to pray. Like, how many times have you been somewhere, maybe you're in a small group, and you're like, don't call on me. I don't want to pray out loud, right? Like, I can get almost anybody in the room to come read Scripture. I bet 10 people will come up here and pray right now if I ask them to, right? We don't want to pray. It's like, listen, I will show up. I'll show up to group. I will bring the Doritos, but I am not praying out loud. That's not going to happen. But if we think through it, the reality is it's the same kind of mentality. I don't want to look. It's about me. It's not about God. And so we have to remember that our prayers aren't self-centered. Our prayers aren't about us. When we pray, we're, we're not praying for us. We're, we're going to war. And so he says, don't be like the hypocrites. Who, who think, who want to be seen by other people. And then look at verse seven when he says, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, where they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So again, he, he's pointing out the things not to do in prayer. And we know that some prayers don't work. Here's generally how we'll pray if, if we're not sure we're in the right ballpark praying. Have you ever prayed this? God, can this happen if it's your will? We kind of have this disclaimer on there. Because why? Because God will bend to our will. <laughs> no promises. God's not going to do anything that is not his will. Um, but we just want to be sure that we're praying the right thing. And Jesus says, don't pray like this. And then he kind of gives this idea of the Gentiles. Gentiles were people who didn't follow God at all or followed the one true God. So they would just use a lot of words over and over and over and again, because they wanted to persuade God to reach down and answer their prayer. They were negotiating with God. They were negotiating with God. It reminds me a little bit, years ago, there was this thing called The Secret. Maybe you remember it. Anybody remember The Secret when it came out? Like a handful? Basically, it's this idea that the universe wants to reward you. So if you just think positive thoughts, you just visualize what you want to happen, that's going to happen for you. And so let's just say you're, you know, down at, you know, you're going to Target and you need a parking spot and you need one really close. You just think it, you just think it open, right? There's an empty spot there and it's going to happen for you. How many times has that worked, by the way? Um, but, but nothing wrong with positive thinking, of course, but we're not trying to get God to pay us back. He's not the force. He's not the genie. God and I are not brokering a deal, right? We're not negotiating because what happens, it gets very transactional in our prayers if we're not careful. It goes a little bit like this. You know, God, you, get, you find yourself in a very difficult situation and you start bargaining. You know, God, if you'll just heal this person, then I will. I'll give you this or I'll start doing that. Or God, if this plane does not go down <laughs> when we land, here's the deal. As if God has anything that we need. Like, do you realize there's billions of people in the world now? And over the course of history, there has been billions of people in the world that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, God isn't looking to negotiate. God's just looking for us to give him our heart. That's what God is up to. Man, small prayers aren't going to cut it. There's a quote by Eugene Peterson. Um, he says this, cut flower prayers are prayers that are disconnected from the living relationship with God. So you think about what a cut flower is. You buy some flowers down at Publix or at a florist, and they're what? Dead, right? They're dead. They look pretty for a little while. And so Peterson's just saying, cut flowers, they're just prayers. They don't really have a life-giving relationship with God. They're just going through the motions, trying to negotiate with him. And one of the reasons that we try to negotiate with God is because we don't really believe he's got our best interest in mind. We, we really don't believe that whatever happens is going to be good for us. This was the first sin in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And this is what we see happen in our own lives. Job, Job said this. He said, he said, though you slay me, still I will put my hope in you and I will argue, argue my ways to your, to, to your face, is what, Jesus, is what Job said. Man, God wants our best. Luther Martin Luther said this, he says, prayer is not overcoming, overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness, because God wants to bless us. Like, how many people believe, man, God wants, he's got good for me. God wants to bless me. Man, God wants good things for me, even in some difficult circumstances, and even when we go through tragedies, man, what does it look like? 
So Jesus said, don't pray like this. But then he says in verse nine, he says, here's how you pray. And he says, and this begins to capture all that, all that Jesus thought and taught about prayer. Man, Jesus knew it was the hub of operations for his worldly mission. Jesus knew it was the center of power. Jesus knew that in his culture, people were missing this power of prayer because it had become so mechanical and so rote that they missed out on exactly what was supposed to happen. That in prayer, what happens is what the Celtics would call a thin place. That, that, that the, the, the division between heaven and earth would get so close that it was almost like this thin place that you could just reach through the veil and touch heaven. It was called a thin place. And Jesus knew that was what was possible for his followers. Amen, somebody, right? This is what is at stake when we talk about the weapon of prayer. Man, everything about Jesus was shaped in this furnace of prayer. N.T. Wright is a pastor. He said this, prayer is not so much a command as an invitation to participate in the life of God. Hey, don't, don't miss that. Don't let it go by too quick. Like, it's an invitation to participate in the life of God. You came today because on, for some, on some level, you think that God may be involved in your life. And you may not know that he is, but there is at least some small inkling of hope that that's possible. And what this secret weapon does is it shows us what's possible. It gives us the power. It points the way towards our connection with God. Man, that's what, that's what Jesus is trying to point out. Let me ask you this question. Who discipled you to pray? Who taught you how to pray? Like, think about it. Who taught you how to pray? Like, so I, in, in the first service, I said, how many people grew up in a liturgical tradition and nobody knew what that meant? So I'm not going to do that to you. But if you were in liturgical or maybe Presbyterian, Catholic, Episcopalian, Anglican, just by show of hands, right? So, so you get it. You, you learn to memorize some prayers, right? And here's the reality. In the kind of the Protestant Reformation, we've lost some of the beauty and the power of some of the uh, of, you know, prayers that you memorize and recite because you can recite a prayer and it still comes from your heart. You can recite a prayer and it just comes out of nowhere too. But there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I use written prayers of early church fathers every week, every day actually because there's some power in them. So some of you learn to pray that way. How many of you guys learn to pray? Maybe, maybe you are non-denominational. You learn to pray non-denominational. God's my pal. We're buddies, friends. I'm going to go fishing. He's with me in the car. We're watching Netflix together. Uh, this is the Lord. This is, how, this is how I view the Lord, right? That, that discipled you. It formed you in how you pray. You, you're formed in prayer by maybe listening to me pray or John or one of our worship leaders. Man, we're formed in so many ways. This is Jesus forming us in prayer. There is no better teacher. Am I right? Right? There's no better teacher than Jesus. Jesus has given us the model. Now, now verse 6, Jesus says this. When you pray... Do what? Go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. He says, shut the door. Your parents ever have to tell you to shut the door, right? We've heard that phrase, shut the door, a lot. And you're about to hear it a lot in the next five minutes. Shut the door. Turn to your neighbor, say, shut the door. Like I halfway expect my wife to come up on stage and say, shut the door, because I don't always shut the door. Man, shut the door. There's something back there that happens. There's some priority that you're giving. How about this? Your boss calls you, says, hey, come in my office. You come into his office, and he says, shut the door. One of two things, right? I can see the pessimists in the room. Like, you know, you're, you're about to get fired, or you may get a promotion. Who knows? But you know something special is going to happen. What? When you shut the door door. I mean, it just shows priority. Now, here's what's amazing about this. Jesus says that the, your father who sees in secret will reward you. So where is God looking? In the secret place, behind the shut door. He's saying, when you shut the door, you're giving me priority. When you shut the door to pray, when you shut the door to employ and deploy the secret weapon, man, you're, you're shutting the busyness out that's about to overtake you. Man, you're shutting out the noise that's coming in you from the outside. Man, you're cutting out the static 
in your life. He says, shut the door. Listen, the Bible's clear to pray at all times. You should pray at all times, okay? We should all pray at all times. You should pray for a parking spot. I made a joke about that. I know. Pray for your parking spot. You don't need more steps. Just pray for a parking spot. You pray for joy. Bless my day, Lord. There's some prayers that we pray like that. But then there is a time that you need to get alone, that you need to shut the door. I just want you to imagine for a minute that, that you just kind of gave up the, the, the simple Devo life, the quick blinkest version of Bible reading and prayer, that, that you just didn't settle for the verse of the day in five minutes praying, and that you just shut the door and got along with the secret weapon to see what God could do in your life. If you took the time and imagine the power that's available to you, imagine that those prayers sown over months and years and decades, imagine the reward that would be there and the prayers that would get answered if we what? Shut the door. Just get behind the door. And there is a great story about this over in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha is a prophet. And Elisha, uh, pretty powerful and prominent in the Old Testament. And so Elisha comes across a widow and he's, he's just having this conversation with her, and she's crying out to him because her husband has died, left her with a lot of debt. She's afraid that the creditors are going to come and try to take her two kids. So Elisha said to her, he said, what do you want me to do? And she said, all I have is a jar of oil. That's it, a jar of oil. He says, do, he says go into your whole village, get every little, every little jar you can find, every, all of them, bring them into Bring them into your house. So she goes and she does that. She gets all the jars, all the mason jars, whatever she could find, empty vessels, the Bible calls it. And then in verse four, it says this, go in and what? Shut the door behind you and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So you get the picture. She's got one jar of oil. She's got all these empty jars around. She pours it. It fills up. She sets it aside. Well, She's only got one jar, so she's just going to fill one jar up, right? So she went from him. She shut the door behind herself and her sons, and as she poured, they kept bringing the vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And then he said to her, there's not another, and the oil stopped flowing. So you see what happened. This woman is blessed because she shut the door. She got this image of what it meant to be alone with God and to let him answer her prayers, to let him be her source of, uh, of, of uh, prominence, to be her source of purpose, to be her provider. That's what God did. Where? When he shut the door. Shut the door. Now, let me take it one step further. In the Bible, oil is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. Follow me. Oil is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just God's active presence in your life. If you're not kind of figuring all that out right now, that is what the Holy Spirit is, God's active presence in your life. So she shuts the door, and this oil is poured out. God's presence is poured out when she shut the door, when she got in the secret place. Like, this is the promise that Jesus is giving us. When you shut the door, when you go to a secret place, when you get alone with God, you take the secret weapon that he's given us, the king's prayer, power happens. I mean, that weapon changes kingdoms, transforms people. I mean, you don't think you hear God? You know what you need to do? Shut the door. You don't think God sees you? Shut the door. And if you want to be changed, man, shut the door. Take your time. In the morning, get along with God. Shut the door. Look at the Lord's Prayer, the secret weapon. Man, if you could be guaranteed every day to go to a place where you got encouraged, man, where you found wisdom for the day, and wouldn't you just change your plans to get to that place? This is the promise, that when you shut the door. So we see the secret weapon, man, it's deployed in the secret place. Now, let's jump down to verse 9. Uh, the rest, excuse me, the rest of verse nine. It says, pray like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus opens up this prayer with our father in heaven. Th this would have been um, radically uh, uh, um, different for what the Jews would have thought. 
They, they never would have understood that this is how you could pray. So what Jesus is trying to do is to orient our lives differently. You know, there's a decision-making theory called Oda Loops. Uh, observe, decide, act. You look at your raw data around you, you figure out what you need to do, you decide on that, and then you act. But in the Air Force, there's a, there was a military um, officer named John Boyd who came up with the OODA loop. How many people have heard of the OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. Because sometimes the raw data that you see isn't giving you all the information that you need. So for instance, you could be a pilot and you could be flying down and you think you're flying up, or you could be flying up and you could think you, you're flying down. Now, if you're not a pilot in the room, that is bad when that happens, okay? That is bad. So you have to orient. How? By looking at the instruments. By looking at the instruments. And listen, the raw data in our culture, the raw data will tell you one thing. They'll tell you you're just an accident that happened billions of years ago. It came from some amalgamation of cells that kind of made this cocktail, and somehow they started some life form, and guess what? Here you are. And so if that's the case, guess what happens when you die? You just go back to that. You're just going to go back to being just this mixture of cells. And so in the meantime, you should just fend for yourself. It's all about you. You're only here for a certain amount of time. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. And you, you just have to pull yourself up and make it happen. And if we get that raw data without the right instrumentation, it's going to lead us to a destructive life. Amen, somebody? Right? It's going to lead us down a path that none of us want to go down. you got to have orientation. That's what this prayer does. And this is why it's so powerful and why it's a, why it's a weapon. It orients us to heaven. Number one thing it orients, it orients us to our identity, to our true identity. And we're, we are children of our heavenly father. Like when, when you have a dad that you know, is loves you, that you can call for advice, that can fill in any gaps you may have. And when you know, it just gives you some stability and confidence in life, amen? Right, there's this saying that says, there's no limit to what a loved person can do. There's no limit to what a loved person can do. I love this statement. I'm dangerous for my king because I'm loved by my father. I'm dangerous for my king because I'm loved by my father. And sometimes the data that we see around us is not, is not true. Man, what's true is not the inadequacy of our resources, because you know why? Everything in the heaven and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. What's true is not the darkness of the moment, because weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. What's true is not the size of the enemy, because Jesus, God said in Psalm 23, it says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will what? Chase after me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's true is not just the consequences of my failure. The Bible says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What's true is not the mirage of fear because why? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And what is most true is that we have a Father who is in heaven, who loves us deeply, and who wants to give us good things. Man, we have to tell ourselves that every day. You know who's not telling you that? The news. <laughs> your phone. Man, that is not telling us that, and you have to hang on to that. Second thing it orients us to is to God's identity. Jesus uses this word, hallowed be your name. It just means holy. It just means one of a kind. It just means he's set apart. He's not one of many. He is first, he's best, he's last, and he's most. He is everything. Holy means whole. It means he's unbroken, set apart. And it's really good for us that God is holy. That is great news for us that God is holy. It orients us to God's identity, not just our identity. And then the secret weapon, it releases kingdom power. When he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it reminds us that we live in this collision of kingdoms. You know that. Like when you wake up in the morning, you, you're waking up to a world at war. Many times you can't see it, but it doesn't, you don't have to go far to see it. And sometimes it doesn't feel like it's real and sh showing up on the shores of your life, but it does. 
And as we read in the paper or we watch things that happen, we, we know that evil is out there seeking whom it can devour. And what the Lord's Prayer does, it helps us to pray into the kingdom so that we can see kingdom power unleashed in our lives. It brings heaven to earth. And when we don't realize that, we just live for smaller kingdoms. You ever realize how small the kingdom is sometimes in your life? Like if you think about some of the prayers that you prayed, they're, they're just, they, they can be so small. They can be so mundane and they can be so temporary. And Jesus is inviting us into a kingdom prayer to see the kingdom of darkness eradicated and the kingdom of our king unleashed on the world. Heaven comes to earth because that means that what we do here actually matters. And if heaven comes to earth, then what we do here actually matters. There's a pastor named Herman Bavink, and Herman said this, the more abundantly the benefits of civilization come streaming our way, the emptier our lives become. In other words, the more stuff we have, the less we have. With all the wealth and power, it only shows that the human heart in which God has put eternity is so huge that all the world is too small to satisfy it. Heaven comes to earth. What if you got in eternity the things that you prayed for today? You can get a parking spot in heaven. It's the first thing that pops to mind. Man, what if you got in eternity the things that you prayed for today? Like what, what family member of yours is making it in? And what, what brokenness are you praying into eternity? What injustice are you praying for that needs to be rectified? Like what people are you praying for? What kingdoms are you praying for? We gotta learn to pray kingdom prayers. I want you just to just imagine your family 10 years from now, 20 years from now, beyond. Imagine your family and the prayers that you prayed over them for months, for years, for decades, what that could do in your family. I just want you to imagine a church that took this vision of being a house of prayer seriously. It didn't just settle for church as usual but really leaned into the promises of God as they surround prayer, that really believed that this was a weapon used to move kingdoms, to start churches, to rescue people, that really believed that darkness was on the march and there was a way to push it back. It was through their prayer. Because see, uh, to be a house of prayer, we gotta have homes of prayer. And to be a home of prayer, you gotta be a person of prayer. How do you do that? You shut the door and you get the secret weapon out and you just see what God's gonna do and you just pray kingdom prayers let me ask you, what door are you going to shut? What door are you going to shut? Like there's two ways to look at this. Number one, literally, what door are you going to shut? Your office door, maybe? Your kitchen door? Your pantry door? Your closet door? Your car door? Like whatever door you need to shut so you can get to the secret place, you need to shut that door and you need to get along with the, with the secret weapon, with the Lord's prayer. You need to understand what it means to live and walk in power. Like imagine what would happen there. There's some doors that you need to shut. There's some figurative doors we need to shut. Man, we need to shut the door on complacency. And we need to shut the door on small-mindedness. We need to shut the door on shallow living. We need to shut the door on some things in our life so we can really step into the grand story that is the kingdom. Amen, somebody? Man, we need to learn what it means to shut the door. Let me close out with this story, with this teaching. You know, in Jesus' day, they didn't, they didn't have full access to the presence of God. The presence of God was in the center of the temple. It was called the Holy of Holies, right? You couldn't go in there. And the only people that got to go in were the priests on certain special occasions. Um, so you could recite some prayers and say some things, but there was really no direct access to God. As a matter of fact, there was this massive curtain that went all the way around this area of the temple so that nobody could go in unless you were the priest. So you were dependent on the priest for access to God. If you wanted forgiveness of sin, you know, the priest had to go in and, and confess that and offer sacrifice for you. If you needed some direction from God, man, the priest had to be the one to tell you. Everything was dependent on this. And to have direct access Access, they would have killed for that kind of access to God. 
But Jesus died so we could have that kind of access to God. Amen? Like Jesus died so that this veil literally in the Bible, we see that when he was executed and gave up his spirit, that that veil was torn in two, just symbolizing that we have full access to God. We don't need a mediator anymore because he's our mediator. We don't need a priest anymore because he is what? The great high priest. This is who we have. And this is the access we have to pray. Like who wouldn't, who wouldn't take advantage of that access? Listen, when you have access, you have power, right? When you have access, you have power. Like my family have a lot of access to me. I'd do whatever I could to move heaven and earth for them whenever they needed it. And the same is true of God. Man, we have access to God. And this changes things. Because now that we have access to God, we can pray. And our lives can experience power. That's what weapons do. So what does it take to get that access? Glad you asked. There's this, there's this good news in the Bible. We call it the gospel and that God came and created heaven and earth, and he created it for us to fully enjoy. Why? Why would God do that for us? Because he's good. That's his character, and he's so good. But, but there is a problem. Well, we've lived in our own small lives and our own small kingdoms and thought that was going to be best. It's called sin. And sin is what separates us from God. It prevents us from having access to God. But the hope that we have is Jesus, that Jesus came and he paid the penalty for our sin. He died for our sin so that we could have access to God. And, and the response is just to surrender our lives. And maybe for you, the reason why you don't think you can pray and the reason why you don't feel like God wants to hear your prayers and the reason why is because you're not a citizen of the kingdom. That You've never taken the time. You've never made the commitment to follow him because you thought you could just negotiate a little bit or maybe just using him in some areas that maybe he felt like he was proficient at, but it's everything. And maybe for you, today is the day where you just need to commit that you're going to be a citizen of the kingdom and you're going to follow the king. So if that's you, this is what we want to do. I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then we'll close out with worship. So let's bow our heads.